Welcome everyone. It's lovely to see you all here in the Wills Memorial Building on this Friday evening. I'm Judith Squires, I'm Deputy Vice-Chancellor and Provost here at the University of Bristol and it's a great pleasure to be introducing Trevor Thompson, this evening's speaker. Inaugural um, lectures are a very special moment for the university community. They're an opportunity for us to come together as academics, as students, as friends, families, members of the public, to learn about an academic journey that's led to the successful um, uh, uh, award of the title of professor. It's an opportunity for us to celebrate that achievement and to learn something about the journey that led to it. Let me briefly introduce Trevor to you. Trevor was promoted to professor in 2018. He grew up during the time of the Troubles in Belfast. Though wedded to the Irish landscape, like most of his contemporaries, Trevor went off to university across the water. He was a scholar at Jesus College, Oxford, and president of Oxford University Medical Society, from where he graduated in 1986 with a double first in physiological sciences. He pursued his clinical studies at St Mary's Hospital in Paddington, from where he graduated with a degree of uncertainty in the completeness of biomedical sciences. Following a woman, who later he married, he moved to Yorkshire for vocational training and general practice, including a life-changing six months as a junior doctor in the spectacularly busy A&E department at Leeds General Infirmary, or Jimmy's, at Leeds. Then followed four years in Glasgow, including a spell at the Glasgow Homeopathic Hospital, where under the tutelage of Dr David Riley, he explored the wonders of whole-person approaches. Trevor's lifelong love of research and teaching took a boost when he was awarded the prestigious Higher Professional Training Fellowship in Glasgow under the wing of Professors Graham Watt and Jill Morrison. Jill, who is now the external examiner for our new medical programme here at Bristol. The fellowship included an MSc in primary care, split between teaching, research and management. And Trevor's MSc research on advanced directives was later published in the BMJ. This portfolio led him to apply for a clinical lectureship here at Bristol, having followed that same woman in 2000. His early career was massively influenced by his boss and mentor, Professor Debbie Sharp. To his surprise, he finds himself still working in the Centre for Academic Primary Care, which she established. Milestones for Trevor include a PhD in 2005, setting up our culture-changing BA in Medical Humanities, leading on our award-winning Whole Person Care course, and being awarded the Higher Education Academy's somewhat elusive National Teaching Fellowship in 2015. From 2015, Trevor has been Head of Teaching for Primary Care, engaging body and soul with the phenomenal te team endeavour that was MB21. This, I think, has been the most radical reform of our medical education at Bristol for 25 years and is set to standard is in this good stead for the coming 25 years. Appointed Professor of Primary Care Education in August 2018, we now look forward to hearing what exactly Trevor has been up to all these years, learning medicine at the edge. Trevor. Yes. Wow. Thank you, Judith. So, um, who have we got here tonight? Um, I'm seeing my, my mother-in-law and my father-in-law, two of my three brothers, two of my three sister-in-laws, two of my four children, and my one and only wife. Um, and uh, in, a, in a country that I recently fell in love with, Zimbabwe, no event like this would be complete without some mention of the ancestors. Would that be true? And uh, I, I remember my, my own mother and father who both enjoyed a great sense of occasion. And I can see in the audience members of my core teaching team who have to put up with me on a weekly basis. 
and colleagues from diverse parts of the university and a smattering of students. Friday night, unbelievable. Uh, and esteemed colleagues from Wellspring Surgery. There's one of those, yes. Um, where I work as a general practitioner and have done since 2006. And I also see a few colleagues from the wider world of general practice. Those people are doing the heavy lifting on our courses, week in, week out. Um, and a contingent of friends who are really keen to get an answer to the question, what does Trevor Thompson actually do in the university? Um, is that everyone? Anyone that unclassified so far? Okay, a couple of random members of the public. So... Here we are, it's Friday night, and what do, you hope to, what do you hope to happen in the next 45 minutes? Well, certainly quite a bit of celebration. Um, I, I don't just like this university, I actually can honestly say I love it. So that's one thing. Another thing to celebrate is teaching. Now, as Judith uh, will well know, most people who give talks like this are researchers, but every now and again, they give, a, they give a, a professorial position to a teacher. And I would like to reach out to all the people in this room who are teachers, of which there are many, and say, what we do actually is quite important. And the university, the universities, are recognising that and increasingly, increasingly recognising it. I'd also like to celebrate some ideas tonight, things that have... Um, inspired me in my work as an educator. See, becoming a professor actually had very little effect on my, my workload, um, and what I did during the week. The, a much bigger change occurred, as Judith said, in 2015, when I became head of teaching for primary care, when my close GP colleague, Dr. Andrew Blythe, moved on to higher things. And um, I'll tell you a bit of what we're doing as a, as a department at some point. But I have noticed one subjective difference about becoming a professor, and that is that um, I still worry about what people think about what we, we do, but I feel less concerned about what people think about what I think. And I think that's quite important. I think a university is a place where people should be able to ask and try and answer difficult questions, questions that are perhaps countercultural, questions that might put you for a while on the edge of things. And that is one of the themes I'd like to explore tonight, which is this whole thing about being at the edge. And by edge, I mean the kind of boundary over what we think we definitely know for sure. Or perhaps the edge lands between two different perspectives on life. So, for instance, I've spent a lot of time considering the boundary between the art, medicine as art and medicine of science. And these edges are... Um, characterized by complexity. And what I've learned in my career is to actually enjoy and celebrate complexity rather than try and run away from it. My personal journey into medicine, because you invited me to, to share that, did actually begin at an edge. And it was the edge, in fact, between life and death. Because when I was 16, my leg took a hell of a thump in a motorcycle accident. In fact, I had a transverse fracture mid-shaft of my left femur. I had a compound fracture of my left tibia and fibula. And I enjoyed 10 weeks of enforced work experience uh, in a hospital while I forged my destiny as a doctor. And meantime, medicine was saving my leg and saving my life. And, and I feel that um, the beautiful efficiency of trauma care slightly seduced me into an unrealistically simple view of how medicine actually works in practice. And I do have such moments of glorious simplicity when I'm a GP. So mum walks in with a bemused daisy in tow, and daisy's had a bit of an itchy bottom. And so I ask a few questions, and pretty soon it's clear that this is the problem and that this is the solution. And, um, you know, the thing that's so lovely about that, it's, it's, um, it's a really clear diagnosis, it's, it's a treatment please don't disabuse me, of which there, as far as I'm aware, no serious side effects. And everybody leaves the room reasonably happy. But often in my practice, things just aren't that simple. Take something super common, like um, hypertension, high blood pressure. Now, we know that people with high blood pressure have a higher all-cause mortality. They basically die sooner 
than people with lower blood pressure. So quite reasonably, as a profession, we put a lot of effort into lowering blood pressure, mainly with medications. And we have helpful protocols for, I use the words advisedly, management of hypertension. And um, this is one of them. This is from, from the, this is from the so-called NICE guidelines. And to be honest, these are pretty useful in practice. But there's quite commonly, certainly in my practice, complications and complexities. And I love the phrase, no plan survives contact with the enemy. And in this case, for instance, you see the second one down, it says lifestyle interventions. Well, I'm not really sure what to do about that. You know, I've never really been properly trained in lifestyle interventions, so you know, I pay lip service to it, but I don't really know what I'm doing. And similarly, the patient may just not want to take the medication I give them. Or when I give it to them, they get side effects that annoy them. Or the medication interacts with some other problem they have and makes that worse. Or, indeed, the evidence for what I should be doing changes. So just last week, I read this report in the BMJ. And um, it doesn't really conflict with the NICE guidelines. But what it basically shows is that people with uncomplicated, mild hypertension have exactly the same health outcomes if they are treated or if they are not treated for their high blood pressure. So the implication of this sort of research is that I can just chill out a little bit about worrying about some of my patients with uncomplicated, mild hypertension, for instance. Now, uh, what I'm driving at here is, is just that in the real world of medicine, um, things are often a bit com complex. And one of the sources of that complexity is the, the attempt that we make to use information from population studies to treat individual, pesky, very individualised people. Now, one way to try and represent what I'm, I'm trying to get over just now is this thing. It's known as the agreement certainty diagram. And um, if I could just illustrate, in the bottom left-hand corner, we have situations where everybody knows what to do, so... Everyone knows what's going on and everyone knows what to do. And at the top right, we have situations where people have absolutely no idea what's going on or what to do. And in between these two places is where I feel I spend most of my time as a doctor in this sort of edge land of complexity between certainty and complete chaos. And um, it's felt like my mission to sort of help students um, engage with complexity in their, in their training. So I'm going to give you a few examples now. And to, to get this, to enjoy this part of the talk, you will need to get hold of one of these. If, you're at, if you haven't got one, you're sitting too near the back. Okay, so I'm going to get you to vote on this question. So the question is, do you consider this a simple, complex, or chaotic situation? There's no right answers. I'm just going to, I'm going to pull the... We get a, not everyone has probably voted, but let's get a, get a look at it. Okay, so we've got a majority of people thinking it's simple. Let's try this one. This is something roughly like this would not be atypical in our practice in Barton Hill. 65-year-old man with extreme anxiety who lives alone and dials 999 at least once a week. I'll, vote, I'll take your vote on that. Okay, so now you see how it's shifting now. The, the, the center of gravity has moved to complex. Let's do one more, okay? This is very top topical tonight. I believe the, the M5 is basically shut down. Uh, Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see what happened there. Oh, my God. <laughs> Don't even go there. Right. So... I said a few moments ago that tonight I'd like to ce celebrate some ideas uh, that have excited me. Uh, not just me, but a cohort of educationalists, quite a few of whom I can see in this room just now. Ideas that might shed light for students on the nature of complexity. So the first I would like to engage with are the, is the philosophy of holism. It sits in relationship with another hoary stream of philosophy in, in, in the West, and that's of reductionism. And here is an extract there from the introduction to one of the most common textbooks of pathology that our students use. So it says that the health of the individual has its origin in healthy cells. Disease, on the other hand, reflects the dysfunction of a significant number of cells. 
So here you have a fundamental idea that health has its origin in healthy cells. And from an early age, I have felt some intellectual difficulty with this perspective. And soon after I arrived in Bristol, I had the opportunity to turn those doubts into a major educational initiative. Around 2000 myself, 2001, sorry, myself and my colleague sitting here, Dr. Catherine Zolman, created a theme within the curriculum at Bristol called Whole Person Care. And um, this was designed to champion holism in medicine. And by amazing coincidence, just then, my then boss, Dr. Professor, sorry, Debbie Sharp, was able to offer us four half days of curriculum time um, in the first year of the medical degree. This is unheard of. This is gold dust. And thus began our mildly famous whole person care course that ran, did it not, for 15 years. And here is one of the contributors to that course. Uh, now, what I would like to do now is to, with, with luck, show you a little video of starlings very close to where we are now, really, in action. Now, I use this illustration to um, bring out one of the core concepts within holistic philosophy, which is that from the interaction of re reasonably simple parts, sorry, I shouldn't really call a starling simple, much more complex patterns can em emerge. And no amount of studying one individual starling will help you understand the pattern of the murmuration. And it's like that with diagnoses. So you have a patient with heart disease, a patient with lung disease, and a patient with kidney disease, and you can't really treat those as three separate diseases because they, new things emerge when you put those together. As um, I think would Professor Salisbury agree, something like frailty or perhaps drug interactions um, are emergent properties. And, Something it's good, isn't it? I think some of my students have seen this one before, but I just think this is quite a nice little illustration of the same principle, which is that um, when... Well, basically, that the whole is more than the sum of individual parts. So here is what's... This is a simple pendulum. I don't know if you can see it at the back. But this, this functions just like on, the, you know, on a clock. It goes back and forward. And in mathematical terms, the attractor is a single point because it tends to eventually, well, it's a line that converges to a point. Now, if we put two of these in series, um, two very they're extremely simple pendula, let's see what happens. It's a lively wee fella. Uh, you can't actually predict what that pendulum is going to do. It's, it's only got a limited number of moves. But when it's actually going to perform those moves is not something that you can easily predict. So when the previous... Stop it there. When that, um, that person who wrote the introduction to the pathology textbook says that um, we should consider things at the cellular level. Of course, that is undoubtedly true. But we have to think of other levels of complexity as well. And to drive that point home, during the whole person care course, we draw on a term that's coined by a um, Russian polymath, Arthur Kostler, and that is the holarchy. And this is kind of a nested hierarchy of levels within human organization. And the students are taught that problems in the human system can emerge at every level, as can solutions. And I'd like to just share briefly something about this level. Do you know what this picture on the right of the slide is showing me, anybody? Yeah, this is, this is a hole over the Arctic um, due to, to lack of ozone. And this was an example of an edge. Because the question is, should these medical students have as their concern just the case of the person in front of them, or is it a legitimate concern of theirs, things like social justice, or indeed the state of the global environment? And this edge land was 
for several years of my career, the main focus of my work, um, rising to the wider call to doctors from institutions like the British Medical Journal. And I believe, and I strongly, that this is indeed one of the duties of the doctor. When we see in the news the impact of things like climate change on the health and well-being of humanity, particularly the lower income communities of humanity, it seems to me like something of a no-brainer. So I set up a short course in sustainable health care, and we had a hell of a lot of fun with this. This is an example. The students set up a farmer's market outside the Senate House. Judith, was this still running? I think it is still happening. I mean, that's a hell of a parsnip, that girl's sporting. <laughs> and uh, this course formed the seed of a co-authored book with my colleagues Knut Schroeder and David Pension on sustainable healthcare. Here's the book. That's the cover that the BMJ Books wanted us to use. And here's the cover that my mate Knut Schroeder wanted to use. I think his was much better, but BMJ Books just didn't have enough sense of humour. It, it only, it sold 732 copies last time I checked, which apparently isn't bad for an academic book. It's, it's ridiculously expensive. I, I wouldn't recommend it. But, um, <laughs> but, but, but what, it, what it did lead to was an incredible number of public speaking opportunities, uh, along winsome titles like The Green Death and Other Necessities, where I rail against the human, the fiscal, and, of course, the environmental impact of the extraordinary medical care that we tend to dish out at the end of life. And avoiding unhelpful things at the end of life seems to be something I'm, I'm kind of tuned into because, my, um, uh, my, as Judith mentioned, when I did my S MSc much earlier in my career, I had a piece of empirical ethical research on advanced directives published in the British Medical Journal. These are the documents that people write when they are in sound mind for the sorts of care they would want if they were unable to choose. So that is one aspect of the, the holarchy that I've unpacked in some depth. And of course, within this whole person care course, we went on to explore all of these things in, in, uh, in some depth. I mean, why, for instance, might we have shown the students this slide? It's because sometimes legislation is actually the most important thing by far. Isn't it just great that you can't smoke in a pub, particularly if you're not a smoker? That's a wonderful thing. And you know, that's been achieved by you know, the consciousness of the lawmakers, crucial aspect of medicine. Now, obviously, the whole person care course had a great deal to say about the whole person. So we unpack the whole person. How do you describe the whole person? How do you teach the whole person? I mean, there isn't a right answer. I mean, we did something pretty simple. We divided the whole person into thinking, feeling, and sensing. Now, sensing's a bit... I'll have to explain that one. Um, sensing is how we describe those symptoms. I'll name some of them. Headache, sleep disturbance, aching muscles, bloating, itching skin, bladder irritability, sexual dysfunction, sleep disturbance... These, these are actually remarkably common phenomena that most people have at some time. So I'm just going to do a little check on this. If you could get your e-voting pad out. And the question is, have you had one of these types of symptoms? I've called them dynamic symptoms. The ones I've just listed in the last week, say, at some point. Okay, that's enough. So does that mean that 78% of you are have a disease or are definitely ill? I suspect, I, I think not. I mean, I had a bit of a headache this morning, for instance, just thinking about talking to you lot. <laughs> when I, I, wrote this, I wrote this paper called Nature Works, Why Don't We? And it, it snapped up some prize or other. And I, in it, I argued that it was such a pity that we put such a lot of effort as doctors into annihilating these types of symptoms. Headaches with antispasmodics, antihistamines, antidepressants, antibiotics. And I argue in this essay that perhaps we should treat symptoms with a bit more respect. Perhaps they, they're signals for something that the system is trying to tell us. Anyway, if you have a sort of higher degree of these symptoms and you go to a doctor with them, in fact, I don't know whether my GP colleagues would agree, but sometimes the encounter doesn't go as well as you might hope because we don't always have a great answer to these sorts of problems. 
We call them sometimes medically unexplained symptoms, and there are helpful ways of, of working with them, um, but they're a goodly source of dissatisfaction, in my view, for doctors and patients alike. So moving on, what is not present in this conceptualize, our conceptualization of the whole person? Anything to do with what would be generally described as the human spirit, the soul, if you like. So we weren't sure, this is a, um, what's the word, a secular institution, and so we thought we should be democratic and we should let the students decide whether the soul should be part of the whole person. And we're going to give you the same opportunity. So don't worry, there's not endless voting, but have a go and tell me whether you think the soul should be included as an element of the whole person. So we've got, you, you're slightly more soul oriented than the medical students. But, but they, they gave it about a 40, a 60-40 in favour of the sole vote. Um, I've made absolutely no attempt whatsoever to define what I mean by the soul. That was entirely your, your soul. Um, but that's as, about as far as we, we got in trying to explain what we were referring to as the whole person. Now, this course gathered around it quite a doughty cadre of tutors. There's quite a few of them dotted around this room, I see. Uh, we often felt we were learning as much as we were teaching when we were delivering this course, but it was also, I'm pleased to say, uh, I don't know why I say remarkably popular with the students. For this, you can see that they either think it's, they agree or agree strongly that the material we were presenting them felt relevant to their training as doctors. And the course did go on to, to win various awards. In its very last year, 2017, it was NHS England's Education and training team of the year. And we've got this comment, just in case you think we're too self-referential, uh, colleagues from outside have peer-reviewed us and think that we were doing quite a good job. So, so far, I've talked about the breadth of holism. So the breadth was the thing from, from the planet right down to the, to the, to the cell. But um, I think holism definitely has an element, not just of breadth, but of actual depth. And depth is really about identity, values, and how the students express those values in the relationships that they try and form with patients and with colleagues. And what gets me out of bed as an educationalist is, is the idea that we can create education that not just informs students, but transforms them not just in terms, as we have here, of what they know and what they can do, but what they actually believe. And unfortunately for us educationalists, this sort of attitudinal learning is actually pretty difficult to construct without, I don't know, sometimes just annoying people. So here's something that works. There is no better edge on the planet than the coast, and it's a place that I seem to find myself massively drawn to. And in 2007, I had a life-changing experience. I went to sea on board a ship for, uh, which was organized by the Jubilee Sailing Trust. It was called Tenacious, and I buddied someone who was living with disability. And I had such a profound experience that I really wanted to make that happen for my students. So, does this woman look happy? Not overly so. The reason she's not overly happy is she's just about to go there. Okay? Right? She later, she later told me that this was one of the best... No, I think she said it was the best experience of her life. Um, and when we got reports back from the students that we eventually shipped out, literally, on these expeditions, we were so stunned by what they had to say that we we decided to create, we tried to study the transformation that's occurring and just have, it's, it's a slightly crazy video, but just listen to 30 seconds of, the, of the, these feisty young people talking about their experience. I cannot recommend this enough. Right. Like, you have to do it. If you have the opportunity to do this, do it. It was <laughs> literally the best week of my life. Just, you, if, you, if you think you want to do this, you know, are you enthusiastic? Do you want to get involved? Because it's just, it's the best thing ever. Mm. Like, back me up here. Yeah, no, I mean, best week of medical school, hands down. <laughs> we got some funding, thanks in no small part to Professor Chris Salisbury. 
I worked with my colleague. Where's um, Dr. Catherine Lamont Robinson? Is she in the room? Yes, hello, Catherine. Yes, she, she, she worked on this. And one of the things that we've discovered in the research was that what really, really worked is what are called disorientating dilemmas. And that's situations where the students' attitudes, remember the attitude slide, were really challenged by the, by the direct experience that could never, ever come from a book. Um, I've got one of my student colleagues here. Could you perhaps just uh, share that quote for us? This is what's known as, in the trade as attitudinal learning. And this research really empowered me to feel good about helping students to really get stuck in. And I, I hope, I don't know whether, I have a few students who've been with me in my practice, and, and like even the first years, I get them doing stuff right from the start. And one of the things I did, which, was, which is I did a collaboration with my wife, Dr. Elizabeth Thompson, now CEO of the National Centre for Integrative Medicine, to create a short course in homeopathic medicine, where again, as the title of the slide would suggest, we basically just threw the students into the most complex ideas we could find from the beginning. And again, we seem to find that this was popular with the students. Maria. Thank you, Maria. So, I said tonight that I wanted to celebrate some ideas. Holism was one that we covered with the holarchy. We've just dis discussed a little bit about transformative learning. But anyone who knows me, you'd have to have on that list the place of art and medicine. And we conceptualize art and medicine in the university like this. On the right, you have what we would call the art of clinical practice, going the extra mile, listening sensitively, being judicious in your choice of tests and treatment, etc. On the left, we have the actual arts um, in medicine. And we find that these can be, be quite usefully divided into two categories. On the left of the arts and the actual arts, we have the medical humanities, and on the right, the creative arts. Now, the medical humanities, I don't know whether you really know what that might mean, it's, it's just the humanities disciplines for instance, philosophy, history, literature, applied to medical themes, um, asking the sorts of difficult, complex questions I just love, and getting reasoned answers. So when the students finished the second year of the course, they spent a year studying medical humanities and then went back into the medical course. And this is now in its 12th year. It's still, I hope, getting full cohorts um, in studying literature, history, philosophy, and in 2001, amazingly, five of the ten students were awarded first-class honours degrees, which is quite unprecedented as a ratio. And this course that we've designed has had quite an impact on the academic culture of the arts faculty. And the evidence for that is from the former dean, yes, who's delighted to have this programme on the books. And medical humanities, he said, had grown to become one of the arts faculty's themes. And I think... If I was Judith, I'd be really pleased to know that this sort of cross-fertilization was happening across these, uh, these faculty boundaries. Um, just as an example of one of the things that we cover in the philosophy of medicine um, is that we teach students about the notion of scientific paradigm. A paradigm, as articulated in this famous book, considered by Guardian Books as one of the most hundred most important books ever written. A paradigm is an established frame of reference for what sorts of questions can be asked in science and how those questions can be answered. And science, of course, does not have permanent paradigms. They change, or to use the usual verb, shift. Um, and often there's a hell of a lot of turbulence when paradigms change. 
as one um, scientific orthodoxy um, it starts to feel that it's got a lot invested in the status quo. Here, here is a, one of, historically one of the most famous examples. Copernicus published his book on the movement of the celestial bodies in 1543, establishing a heliocentric rather than geocentric view of the universe. And that paradigm shift was deeply unpopular culturally. In fact, it remained on the church's list of prohibited books as late as 1835. And I think the ability to hold this sort of scientific relativism, to be open to the anomalies of modern medicine and the possibility of new ways of approaching our dilemmas is really a critical thing to be fostering in our students. Just like the great minds of the scientific past were open to change, Copernicus, Newton, Harvey, Pasteur, doctors, Einstein, and so on. So, that's the medical humanities, but we need to just mention a little bit about the creative arts, because this is something that really is unique, I think, to the Bristol curriculum, and something that's been pioneered by many colleagues, including my colleague, Dr. Louise Uni, at the back there. Um, I don't know whether we may be the only university in Europe to actually have compulsory creativity on the curriculum. And the students' endeavours um, have been expertly curated into a website called Out of Our Heads. Out of Our Heads as in out of our heads and perhaps into our heart, but also out of our heads in the sense that um, mainly students are on the receiving end of knowledge in the curriculum. But here's a chance for the student to actually embody something herself, express something about her individual experience of the medical curriculum. And um, maybe I would say this, but I just am continually amazed. It, it would take you several days to tour this website now. There's so many riches in it, and I, I didn't have nearly enough time to prepare for that. But here's some of the edges. This is the edge between really break, health and breakdown. This is a conceptual uh, representation of, of stress in the workplace. And here, here's another fantastic piece, which is a conceptualization of care. Um, and I like the way it's a kind of... This is the, the student has witnessed a junior doctor comforting a man whose wife has just died. Um, and I'm going to try the next one here because I thought the other thing the students do is they seem to have this knack of getting inside the subjective experience of patients. And this is a student, as you can see, she's met a man who's describing to her what it's like to have a stroke. But in her artwork, in the very sort of essence of it, she seems to have captured what I feel I'm reading there. Let's see if we can make this work. So what I was trying to illustrate there was how students have got underneath the experience of illness, and there's many examples of that. But to sort of bring my, my talk towards its conclusion, I have to say that most of what I've been talking about thus far was from the first 10 or 12 years of my time at Bristol. And then in 2015, two massive things happened to me that derailed things like my lecturing career. And one of them was that I became head of teaching for primary care, as, as Judith said. And the other was that the medical school introduced a radical review of its whole curriculum. And we got 
you know, it was a deliciously complex and radical revision, and we got very much involved with this in primary care. One of the main changes in the new curriculum is the amount of time that students learn in general practice, and this is in line with the policy of NHS England, and it's also part of a specific programme to support medical students towards careers in general practice. And I'll just show you here, this is a map of all the practice, the ones with a little balloon on them at least, are the practices that teach medical students. There's over 200 practices, and is it Barbara, 600 teachers? I mean, it's a phenomenal, almost, I think, a majority, in fact, of general practitioners in the southwest of England are connected to our program, uh, which runs, of course, over five years. And uh, apology for the busy slide, but if we just look at the top, those are years going up from 19, 2016 to 2021, and on the bottom is the total number of half days that a student would experience if they started in year one and finished in year five. And you can see that we, have more, we are more than doubling the expectation upon us um, over the course of the rollout of this new curriculum. And we have done lots of quite clever things to try and make this work, including, I think, some very inspired um, promotional campaigns. But this has entailed a phenomenal amount of effort from my whole team, and um, I really would like to thank them all. I'm going to just give a little message, mention in particular for uh, Mel Butler and Alison Capey. Alison's here, Mel isn't, I think, uh, and, and all, all, the, all the academic staff. So I think we actually need to be wished good luck with this particular project. Uh, so I'd like to end the lecture with um, a look at an aspect of medical ed education that myself and some of my core colleagues um, have been working on, really preoccupied with, for the last couple of years. And that's another edge between the um, experience of the doctor and the experience of the patient in consultations. Now, whole person care, it was great fun, but it was rather siloed. It was this course that only existed in the first year. And I think the students, some of them, looked back slightly wistfully toward, back to it. Others were probably never thought about it again. In the new curriculum, we have this opportunity to make whole person care stretch right across all five curriculum years. And um, we've done that through what we call a helical theme. This is actually a diagram from our old curriculum, but you get the general idea. The students are returning to these ideas now several times during each curriculum year. So educationally... Um, this is a much more solid foundation that I hope we're building. And the particular theme that I, I'm referring to is something that uh, we call effective consulting. It's been pioneered by myself and my colleagues, Juliet Brown and Jessica Buchan. And I have, um, well, we've been, we've been, we've really now rolling this out gradually across the whole curriculum. And it, it's based on various things. And one of them is a new kind of a framework for teaching students about consulting that we call COG Connect. And you can see in the strap line there's three words, cognition, connection, and care. Cognition we see as the development of the mind. Connection is the development of the affective side of the person, the heart. And the care is the practical skills of history, examination, procedures. And our passionate view is that um, the the well-rounded development of tomorrow's doctors has to um, proceed on all of these fronts. And the, the framework is, sorry it's a busy slide, there's a lot to unpack there, but we've created this kind of processual um, toolkit and the students, for instance, will study, when they, when they, when they assess a patient, we are training them to take a, account of the patient's emotional state which is one of those things that's so easily ignored. What's the patient's real fears and concerns? What do they really want out of this consultation? And we're also really curious about how um, problems like, say, arthritis impact on a person's life. And building that right into the curriculum, as well as the normal skills of history and examination. And as you can see at the center of the model, we have some values. We call them the five C's of compassion, curiosity, criticality, um, 
creativity and collaboration. So if you, if you look um, at sort of, what is it, four o'clock, you see activating there. And so, for example, we expect that every student who graduates from Bristol will think that activating patients to help themselves with their, their health issues is just the normal thing that doctors do. I'm pretty much out of time, and there's music and wine to come. But my hope is that this presentation has shown you that medical education, certainly here at Bristol, is not just about delivering the diktats of the General Medical Council, but that um, you know, we really are thinking about how to shape tomorrow's doctors for the 20th first century in all the glorious complexity that that will inevitably entail. Thank you. Trevor, it gives me enormous pleasure to propose the, uh, the vote of thanks for you tonight. That was interesting, it was illuminating, it was intellectually compelling, and I'm sure I speak on everybody here tonight to say that it was a truly wonderful inaugural lecture, a great end to our week and a great start to our weekend. I am so glad you came to Bristol all those years ago, and actually I need to thank our mutual colleague Graham Watt whom many of you will know, uh, for encouraging uh, me to appoint you. Oh, thank uh, you. 18 years ago, I think it is now. 18 years. And as a true intellectual, you came to Bristol as an undifferentiated young academic looking to find a path to follow, which we heard tonight has had several bifurcations, all of which have been successful. Education, research, leadership, sustainability. You're a true polymath. And I think that is what your students love the most. You're not a one-trick pony, far from it. You use your many educational skills to draw them into the learning experience, be it in your own discipline of general practice or further afield, for example, in consultation skills or your work in medical humanities. It's your passion for your work that is so engaging. And I speak for our colleagues here tonight as well as your students. And, of course, some of your colleagues were your students uh, and your That's trainees. True. That's true. Being a professor at the University of Bristol is about excellence. You have truly demonstrated excellence in many ways during your 18 years here and shared much of that with us tonight. It's reassuring to know that you will continue to deliver that excellence in Bristol for MB21 as it takes shape. So. A final thank you, Trevor, for a wonderful lecture. Thank you very much indeed.